Hi, I'm the Septet. Today we're going to be doing something a little different. This will be a first in a series of Let's Reads that I'm going to do. And today, we're going to be starting The Demons at Rainbow Bridge by Jack L. Chalker. Demons at Rainbow Bridge is one of the first science fiction books that I read, and it holds a lot of fond childhood memories for me. And I'd like to share with you some of the joy and wonder that I felt as a child when reading this book. So without further ado, let's dig right in. <clears throat> Two Demons in Amber The ship that roamed the sea of stars descended from heaven towards the blue-green Eden below, as always, looking for the snake. In the colorful terminology of sector mapping, the world below and its solar system were in an area labeled in the common language of interstellar commerce as Rainbow Bridge, after the sounds used to translate the XY plotting coordinates on a map. The words used for the symbols had no intrinsic meaning, and there was no indication that the union of these accidental words would be prophetic. For nine days, the small crossbow-shaped scouting ship had lain off the planet while carefully laying satellites, like the eggs of a giant bird. These had circled and crossed every square millimeter of the planet's surface, photographing and mapping. Other eggs of a different sort had been sent first to the atmosphere to sample and test it, and then gently to the ground in selected spots, and even on and under the great seas that, from a height, seemed to engulf and dominate the continental land masses. All of these sent a steady stream of data back to the mothership, where computers compiled, checked, sorted, double-checked, and evaluated the flood of information received from its children. The process could, in fact, have been totally automated, but very smart beings had learned over the years that you would never remember to program it for all eventualities, and that ships with their own artificial intelligence and full evaluative skills ultimately never seemed to have both a sense of aesthetics and the horse trader's know-how that could tell the measurably right from the commercially right. The ship could do it all on its own, but a second opinion from a different breed was always required. <clears throat> the breed of living evaluators that accompanied the swift scout ships into those blank stocks, <clears throat> blank spots on the star charts known only by their colorful coordinates might have feathers or scales, fingers or tentacles, it might have been hatched from an egg or grown from a pod, it might be male, female, neither, or all of the above. And while it usually breathed oxygen, it might be well more comfortable breathing water or methane or half a dozen other substances. For all that, it was a single breed, distinguished not by its form or race or birthright, but by the fact that those of that breed called Scout had to be of a singular mental bent. It was a fact that all Scouts were mad, the debate still raged as to whether the demands of the job drove them mad, or whether they were mad at the start. In their past, most races had seemed to have a very small number of the breed, no matter how different they otherwise were. There were the pathfinders, the wilderness explorers, the ones who pushed on alone into blanks on the maps. It had been suspected that some factor, anything from genetic intent, engineering to just too much civilization would breed them out of existence. And it was true that a few races now dominated the field, but somehow, whenever someone discovered a new blank on some map, a scout always seemed to be there. This one happened to be named Cymac, a bipedal creature of the basic class two shape with two arms and two legs and a thick torso. 
He also happened to have lumpy mottled skin the color of rotted sewage, which was so thick some bullets wouldn't penetrate it, and a triangular-shaped head that seemed to bob about as if it were on a spring rather than a segmented neck. His ancestors, before the age of synthetics, had fed on giant insect-like creatures by punching holes in them while they still lived and sucking out the fluids. He called himself and his physical race Zymance, which of course basically translated as human being, like most of the exotic names that intelligent life forms call themselves. For terms like racial origin and planetary names, the interstellar tongue deferred to the local one. Otherwise, there would be several hundred human beings who considered all but their all own kind non-human, and almost all of them would refer to their mother world of their race as Earth. <coughs> the triangular head bobbed and weaved like an unattended jack-in-the-box in the wind as it looked over the data digests on the screens. So far, the data looked good. So far, in fact, it looked too good. Worlds well within the carbon-based life zone that contained a readily balanced oxygen-nitrogen mixture within half a percent of optimum, along with the water balance, were quite rare. <clears throat> Normally, you took what you found and then brought in an exploiter team to re-engineer the world into something useful, or, even more frequently when these kinds of worlds were found, there was already some higher form of life calling it home. Not here. There were vast forests and dense jungles, all right, and high mountain ranges, and it was perhaps a tad too volcanic for absolute perfection. But so far the surveys had shown no signs of indigenous race of sentient beings. Oh, you could find the basics there. Creatures that took the ecological position of insects some high-level herbivores and the inevitable carnivores preying on them and pruning their herds, and some rather odd ocean life as well, but nothing to show that anything higher than that had ever evolved here. Of course, as Simak knew, you could never be a hundred percent sure, even if you stayed a month. Intelligence came in the oddest packages and didn't always fit the conventional molds. More than once he, and almost all the other scouts, had certified a world as exploitable, only to have exploiter teams later discover rather nasty surprises down there. That was what exploiters got paid for. Simak's job was to check the obvious. Structures, sign of environmental alteration, patterns that would show species dominance, that sort of thing. If there was any kind of real intelligence on this world... It wasn't the conventional sort. There is an anomaly, the ship's computer reported to him. I had a number of passes made when it showed up, just to make certain, and sent in the highest resolution photographic gear once it was isolated. It is on the east coast of the smaller continent in the northern hemisphere. It is definitely an artificial structure. Just one? The Simanth responded. Yes, one structure on the entire planet. That was bad. Worse than a horde of screaming natives. In fact, because one could often do something even with a primitive population. But a single structure probably indicated that somebody else had found the place first. Identification? Unknown. That is, the structure is of no known type, either in the exchange or in the Mycol or Mesopan groups. In fact, I did not report it immediately because the readings it gave off indicated malfunctions in my own equipment. Put up your best shots on the screens, the scout instructed. The screens blinked and then showed various passes in full three dimensions. Simak immediately understood the ship's problem. The artifact was unlike anything he'd ever seen before. In fact, the five views presented to him didn't even look much like each other. These are not five separate structures? These are all views of the same single object? One object, same coordinates. You can see why I suspected a defect. I checked for all known types of shielding and found nothing in the registers. As far as I can determine, there was nothing to filter or distort the shots, you see. 
the material and basic dimensions, at least, are consistent. The first view showed a structure that resembled nothing so much as a great amber-colored crystal of fine quartz, perhaps forty meters long, its various facets showing clearly, its far end apparently rounded, its near end coming to a multifaceted taper ending in a point. The second shot showed something the same size and color, but now it seemed concave, as if the top were turned inward. The third shot resembled the first, but the smooth sides of each facet were different, as if the damn thing had somehow turned. On the fourth there was no point, but rather a yawning cavity that seemed to reach back half the length of the thing. The fifth was the most disconcerting, with the object seemingly segmented into quarters, with each turned slightly off the other so that the facet walls were broken up and did not match. Well, something is causing discortion, the Zymanth noted. Unless that thing is alive and kicking. Composition? Every analysis comes up with indistinct data, the computer told him. All I can tell you is that it is solid, appears to have some of the properties of glass or glassine plastic, that it is opaque, and that the substance does not appear to exist anywhere else on the planet, either artificially or naturally. There are indications of a low-yield energy source, but a uh, little else. It is effectively dead to all remote analytical tools. There are no signals emanating from it otherwise, so it is not a beacon. And if it is some sort of downed vessel from an unknown civilization, it is not broadcasting anything we can monitor even as a distress signal. Although, in any event, I would find it inconceivable that such a structure could have flown or even been carried here by any known means of transportation or propulsion. Life scan. I get no life form readings that are not consistent with the natural life of the planet. If anyone's home, they either do not match any known type of life or they are very well hidden inside that thing. In other words, the scout muttered, you the most sophisticated and knowledgeable device any known technology can create and program to answer any question and hazard exacting theories on almost any eventuality with a command of facts and data and a thought speed incomprehensibly better than my own. You were telling me, essentially, that my guess is as good as yours, right? Probably better than mine, the ship responded. I do not have nearly your capacity for wild flights of imagination. So it's not a spaceship, not a cargo module, not a house built with materials found on the planet either. So how did he get there? I would not presume to guess. It has been there quite a while, though. It is definitely buried in rock and soil to a fair depth, and there is no sign of construction or melting or other alterations. A good bet is that it has been there a very long time, and that the rock and soil have formed around it. It has not, however, been overgrown by the surrounding vegetation or covered by volcanic ash or debris. This indicates that there is some kind of maintenance function within it that still works. Again, if one had to speculate, it would appear most likely that the thing contains a system somewhat analogous to my position in this ship. It is entirely possible that the whole structure is some sort of artificial intelligence in a shell, and indeed, that may be all that it is. Entirely plausible. You are certain, though, that it is of extraplanetary origin, and not merely an unusual feature. Positive. The energy pulses show a clear-cut power source of some kind, and there is some intake and exhaust of gases. Not a sufficient amount to indicate that the whole structure has full atmosphere, but enough su to suggest that at least a small part of it has. It would be interesting to get a close enough look to analyze the gases it expels. Then let's get close enough. Roll in a remote unit, and let's see just what it's made of, and what its reactions might be to an approach. How long will it take? I have already constructed and programmed such a unit, anticipating your actions. However, it is now past dark down there, in its area, and I would suggest a daytime foyer. Get some food and rest. In the morning, we shall test this thing's metal. be continued in part two of a 
now that I look at it, going to be a rather long series. See y'all later.